So, assalamu alaikum and uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, our series, uh, educational series uh, on uh, STEMI, uh, organized by the uh, Abu Dhabi STEMI Network. Uh, this uh, uh, session or this webinar today uh, is in collaboration with the American Heart uh, Association. We are honored to. To, to have the AHA being part of uh, this educational uh, session. They have been a pioneer in, uh, uh, in these aspects and uh, in terms of uh, uh, managing or, or developing guidelines to, um, uh, in the management of, of STEMI. Uh, so uh, with the Abu Dhabi STEMI network, uh, have been uh, working on uh, improving uh, the care and ensuring there is a better access for patients with the STEMI over the last uh, uh, few years. And it had been a collaboration of uh, different uh, uh, fields in, 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 in the healthcare system from the regulator to uh, the different providers uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi from emergency physicians, cardiologists, uh, nurses, and, uh, and ambulance uh, services, and so on. So uh, a lot of um, uh, work happened over the last uh, few years. Uh, still, there is uh, a lot of work also to be, to be done. And I think these uh, sessions are important to help us uh, uh, bridge that gap. Uh, today, we have a, uh, uh, an excellent panel of uh, of uh, speakers who are going to help us achieve our objectives. Uh, and our objectives, as, as I stated, is improving the, um, uh, the care and of, of STEMI patients in terms of recognition, in terms of triaging, and getting these patients to, uh, to get the right uh, treatment. Uh, today, we have um, uh, from uh, uh, United States, uh, Dr. Elliot Antman, uh, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a senior investigator in the TIMI uh, study groups. And he was the president of the American Heart Association 2014-15. Uh, we have Dr. Ali Shamsi, consultant intervention cardiologist uh, from Tawam uh, Hospital. And we have Dr. Meitha Adduri, uh, who is a left Lieutenant uh, Colonel uh, um, at uh, Abu Dhabi Police, and uh, Victoria Mehta is a consultant emergency um, a physician, and she did a lot of work um, around the management of the pre-hospital uh, care of uh, STEMI. Uh, also, we have Dr. Dirk uh, Richter from the Department of Health uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, and we know the role of the Department of Health uh, in Abu Dhabi um, uh, in terms of regulating and monitoring the care of, uh, uh, of the healthcare. And uh, in, uh, in relation to this, uh, uh, this session, uh, they, uh, they had a lot of work that was done around STEMI um, care. Of course, uh, uh, my co-chair uh, or moderator, Dr. Mahmoud Trainer, who is a consultant intervention cardiologist at Cleveland Clinic, um, Abu Dhabi, and a cath lab director, uh, will be uh, uh, chairing the, uh, this session. So um, without uh, a lot of delay, uh, I will move uh, to our first uh, uh, talk by Dr. Elliot Antman. And as I've stated earlier, Dr. Antman is, uh, is a professor of medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School and a senior investigator at Timmy Group. Uh, and uh, president of the AHA. So he, uh, he participated in uh, a lot of research related to, uh, to STEMI and uh, developing the guidelines. So uh, Dr. Antman is gonna talk to us about strategies for the management of uh, STEMI. Dr. Antman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. al -Zabedi. It is. Uh, a great honor and pleasure both for the American Heart Association to participate uh, in this important session. And for me personally, it is a great honor to uh, join with my friends and colleagues uh, in the UAE to uh, address this issue of uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. Indeed, for 40 years, I've been working on acute coronary syndromes 
and uh, I have spent a lot of time thinking about the ways we should be organizing our treatment strategies for patients with STEMI. And I'll highlight some of those uh, observations in my remarks uh, tonight. Let us begin with this diagram, uh, which uh, describes how we look at a patient clinically. When a person presents to us with ischemic discomfort at the top of the slide, uh, we don't know for sure which end of the acute coronary syndrome spectrum uh, they will be experiencing. Uh, they could have a subtotal occlusion or a total occlusion of the culprit coronary artery. And these are short axis views showing subtotal and complete occlusion of a coronary artery. When we look at the electrocardiogram, patients may present without ST elevation or with ST elevation. We then measure in their blood a biomarker, and now we use troponin, specifically the high sensitivity troponin assays, to determine whether or not there indeed has been myocardial necrosis. Uh, our ultimate diagnosis will be that the patients experienced unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, or ST elevation myocardial infarction. The key management difference is the right-hand side of this diagram. Patients with the complete occlusion of the infarct-related artery require urgent reperfusion. And tonight's session, will be focusing on patients with ST elevation MI. Many of the things that we will be discussing also apply to patients with NSTEMI and unstable angina, but the urgency of reperfusion is not as great. Now, let's look at this classical diagram, which relates time and myocardial salvage. Along the x-axis, we see time. Time zero is the moment of coronary artery occlusion with ST elevation MI. The y-axis shows the mortality reduction that we would achieve if we could open that coronary artery. And if we opened it immediately after it was occluded, we would have 100% of myocardial salvage, and therefore whatever mortality reduction we were going to achieve, it would be maximal at that point. As time passes, our ability to reduce mortality from the loss of functioning myocardium reduces, and that's what the black line shows. And for the first three to six hours, time to treatment is absolutely critical. Our two options for reperfusion are shown in the diagrams here, fibrinolysis or a primary percutaneous coronary intervention. As we move later in time, opening the artery becomes the primary goal, but its time urgency is less imperative. The extent of myocardial salvage is related to the percentage of area uh, at, at risk. Now, I do remember, as do you, the many discussions about whether it was better to use fibrinolysis or move to primary PCI. <clears throat> and that was not certain perhaps 20 or even 30 years ago. But there have been many advances in percutaneous coronary intervention for STEMI. We move, of course, from balloons to enhancement of antiplatelet therapy with P2Y12 inhibitors, aspirin glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors. The dramatic advance, of course, was stenting and moving to drug-eluting stenting. And Perhaps a little bit less uh, important, but uh, some more recent advances would be thrombus removal and embolization protection devices. But all of these advances have led to a uh, community opinion in the medical community, specifically in cardiology, that it is preferable to perform primary PCI if that can be done without a significant delay. So understanding those delays is very important. And many of us have felt that it was useful to divide the delay into the components of time to reperfusion. 
This diagram shows us the patient-related delay on the left. Their symptoms must be recognized by the patient, but we cannot help them and have our first medical contact until they tell us that they are experiencing symptoms. So everything we can do to get the patient to understand their symptoms and contact the medical system quickly uh, is key here. Uh, we then have delays as we evaluate the patient in the emergency department and move to reperfusion. And this is the system delay. We will be talking about the systems uh, this evening in particular. But we must keep in mind that the total time to reperfusion begins from the onset of the patient's symptoms and is, ends with the time when we open that coronary artery. So the chain of survival is shown at the bottom. This is a very important concept. Patient recognition, rapid transport, and now an important addition, the ability to obtain a 12-lead ECG in the ambulance and identify STEMI early. That's important, and you'll hear more about that tonight, because that enables one to contact the emergency department from the field and announce that a patient with STEMI is on the way. And that will enable one to actually activate the system locally. We will talk about how the system works when patients come to a hospital that may be capable of performing PCI or may not be capable of performing PCI. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the general concept of creating a system of care which Dr. Alzebedi introduced with his remarks for this symposium, is a very important one. 13 years ago, the American Heart Association started on this path and created a system of care for STEMI. We called it Mission Lifeline. And what you see here is that by 2015, 85% of the United States was covered by a registered Mission Lifeline STEMI system of care. It roughly correlates with the density of the patient population in the various parts of the United States. We are now uh, proud to announce that we have had great success and we are uh, collaborating with international professional societies and systems so that we can extend Mission Lifeline on an international basis. And we hope that we will, we, we will uh, work closely with you in the UAE to extend this kind of system of care uh, to your country. Well, let's think about the Mission Lifeline STEMI protocol. I've already addressed the fact that uh, part of the system is education so that the patient must recognize their symptoms promptly and they will call emergency medical services. And the key question by, uh, for facing the EMS after obtaining a 12 lead ECG in the field is should we be using fibrinolysis or PCI? And I suspect that throughout most of your region, it'll be rapid transport for PCI. Now, a patient may present to a non-PCI capable hospital and the emergency department decision then is give lysis locally or transfer urgently for PCI. If the patient presents to a PCI capable hospital, the process then is the emergency department needs to contact the cath lab quickly. Hopefully they have received this information from the EMS and want to open up that artery with what we call Jorda balloon or Jorda device in less than 90 minutes. Now, the blue arrows show the possibilities of flow of patients through the system. Uh, they could call uh, 911 in our case or emergency medical services, and the ambulance may take them to a hospital that's not capable of PCI. There may need to be an additional transfer to a PCI capable hospital. But many systems believe that bypassing the non-PCI hospital is an important consideration to shorten the time to primary percutaneous coronary intervention. 
We won't be spending a lot of time uh, this evening discussing other aspects of the management of STEMI, but please keep in mind that in the hospital, our focus is alerting uh, our team to whether there's evidence of recurrent ischemia, the development of heart failure, or arrhythmias. And we will spend just a moment in, in shortly talking about some key secondary prevention measures so the patient never experiences this scenario uh, again. In the beginning of the development of systems of care, a checklist was created to help improve and shorten door to device time. There are five things shown on this slide and they have been introduced into our guidelines and they are part of the Mission Lifeline protocol. We've mentioned much of this already. Uh, the pre-hospital ECG to diagnose STEMI, emergency physicians activating the PCI team, one call, one phone call to the page operator activates the entire team. The goal is to have the PCI team arrive in the cath lab within 20 minutes after that page. And the entire system works well if there's regular, timely data feedback and analysis to members of the STEMI care team to see if there are ways that this can be improved. Now, let's take a look at this diagram because many individuals felt, oh, if we can shorten door to blue time, surely we will reduce mortality. And in general, that is true but it does relate to where you started. So if there was a daughter balloon time, let us say of roughly 150 minutes, this curve shows us we would expect an in-hospital mortality on average of about 6%. But if we reduced it from 150 minutes to 75 minutes, we would reduce the mortality to 3%. So in fact, if we had that uh, 90 minute reduction in door to balloon time, that's significant and the reduction in mortality would track with that. On the other hand, if we were already at a pretty good door to balloon time and we shortened it just a little bit, that's still a good thing to do. But keep in mind that it may not translate into a significant reduction in mortality until many, many tens of thousands of patients were studied uh, over a long period of time. And I just wanted to point this out to you as you think about outcomes. And uh, we had to consider all this as we assess the success of our uh, Mission Lifeline program. Now here is uh, the flow that is recommended in the guidelines put out by the American Heart Association, along with our sister organization, the American College of Cardiology. So here's a STEMI patient who's a candidate for reperfusion. If they are initially seen at a PCI capable hospital, prompt transfer down to the cath lab with a first medical contact device time of less than or equal to 90 minutes. And then the decision making is uh, centered around what we see on the diagnostic angiogram, hopefully being able to perform PCI. If the patient is initially seen at a non PCI capable hospital, the door in to door out time should be less than or equal to 30 minutes for transfer, so that the first medical contact to device time in total will be less than 120 minutes. If that's going to be too long and the patient receives a fibrinolytic agent, that should be given within 30 minutes of arrival at the non-PCI PCI capable hospital. And you can see that the guidelines now talk about urgent transfer of PCI patients with failed fibrinolysis, transfer them urgently for PCI. And even if they have been successfully reperfused with a lytic, the goal is to get them over to the cath lab promptly uh, within uh, three to 24 hours so that we can actually uh, imp consider putting in a stent. Now, how do we uh, recognize hospitals that uh, successfully participate in such a system? Uh, this is the role of certification. 
And this is the way we do it in the American uh, Heart Association. We have had a, a systems of care policy that has been published. It focused initially on STEMI, but it also recognizes the importance of treating patients with end STEMI and stroke, and the systems of care actually help there as well. In 2011, we started a certification system so that hospitals that were capable of PCI, shown here uh, as the black uh, diagram for a hospital, these are referred to as uh, hospitals that receive STEMI patients. Those hospitals that uh, are not capable of PCI, shown in the white diagrams, they refer patients to the receiving hospital. So we refer to this as the STEMI referral hospital and a STEMI receiving uh, hospital. Uh, we now have, in a moment, I'll show you this, a recognition program for such hospitals, and we are prepared to work very closely with you to move to an international expansion of our Mission Lifeline program. To sustain a system of care, it is critical that we have feedback to hospitals, and this is an example of a report form that goes back to a hospital. And it's very important that we track each element of the time delay. And we can then look at each element and say, everything else was working okay, but this is one area where there is a need for significant improvement. And we can start to focus on the causes of that isolated component of the delay and start attacking that, that problem. Those hospitals that are working hard to do this should be recognized, and this is uh, through uh, a, a award, a milestone uh, award, uh, which is in the Mission Lifeline program, the highest would be the Bronze Award, and certification uh, to indicate that a hospital is a STEMI heart attack receiving or referring center. It is important for us to work as a community and we have found that it's uh, extremely helpful to sustain the system of care for people to meet on a regular basis and share their ideas and their best practices so that uh, we can learn from each other. This is a very important component of a system of care as well. I will uh, show briefly now the secondary prevention after a patient uh, is successfully reperfused. Uh, there are six aspects to secondary prevention, complete cessation of cigarette smoking, control of blood pressure to less than 130 over 90, promoting physical activity of at least 30 minutes, five days per week at a minimum, reduction of excess body weight, controlling diabetes to a goal of hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%, and lowering LDL to less than 70 milligrams per deciliter or 1.8 millimoles per liter. And I will close with this slide, and I, I find this so important to emphasize to healthcare providers and our trainees, our cardiology and internal medicine uh, residents and fellows. This is a view of a coronary artery, or let us say any artery, where atherosclerosis has developed over time. The patient has announced to us that they have this problem with atherosclerotic vascular disease when they experience ischemic heart disease, STEMI, for example. But we should take the opportunity to recognize that other arteries may be involved and search for cerebrovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease and make sure that we don't overlook those as possible areas that may need attention as well. So I will stop there. It has been a great honor for me to be able to present this to you. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, we will return to Dr. Alzebedi uh, to move to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Hemmen, for an excellent talk. Uh, that was fantastic. So for those of you who have questions, I uh, will save the questions till the end in the discussion period. So uh, next we have Dr. Ali Al-Shamsi, who's a, uh, the consultant interventional cardiologist at Tuam Hospital. He's also the chief of cardiology and the chair of internal medicine there, and one of the preeminent uh, operators uh, for complex PCI in the UAE. And he's going to update us on STEMI management in the Eastern region.
Thank you. Assalamu alaikum all and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Antman, for your excellent and informative talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Trina and Dr. Abdul Majid Zubedi for giving me the chance to present our STEMI system in the Eastern region. I will share my slides. So it's uh, an opportunity for us to share our experience, the, our challenges, and to learn from, our, from ourselves, actually. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, meeting. Um, I was asked by Dr. Abdelmajid Zubedi and the Emirates Cardiac Society to present the STEMI system of care in the Eastern region. So the Eastern region, um, in 2017, the government has changed the name to Al Ain region. Uh, after the main city of this region, which is the Green Garden City of Abu Dhabi, uh, and we call it Al Ain City. Uh, the population of the Eastern region or Al Ain region is about 800,000 and it's growing region. Uh, there is uh, uh, other areas and uh, regions associated with this uh, Al Ain region. And the most remote area is Al Wagan area which is about 80 kilometers or 50 minutes away from the nearest primary PCI provider. Next, uh, um, so um, I will start talking about, first of all, uh, the al Ain Interventional Group, which was created in 2016. Um, this group actually uh, has developed al Ain STEMI network uh, this, the aim of this network was to gather uh, all the centers, private and uh, public hospitals and allied health services where patients with uh, chest pain might present. The aim was to include all Al Ain region interventionalists, cardiologists, ER physicians, cat nurses and technicians, private and public hospitals. Through Al Ain STEMI network that we created in 2016, we were, and we still conducting regular meeting quarterly, discussing our interesting cases, statistics of the region, and the challenges we are facing. Uh, through this uh, uh, group, we uh, developed the Al Ain Region Unified Chest Pain uh, Pathways, which was like the pipe for our work. So uh, we implemented the Al Ain Chest Pain Pathways in 2017 across all the regions the private and public ERs and the allied health service clinics where they are part of the Al Ain network. So we managed since then to include around 60% of the centers where the chest pain patients will present in Al Ain region. And we are looking for uh, to reach 100%. So this chest pain pathway, it has two forms. One for the primary PCI capable hospitals receiving patients with chest pain directly to their ERs. Second form of our uh, chest pain pathway was for non-primary PCI hospitals and clinics needs to transfer their patients to primary PCI capable facility. So in, in the region of Al Ain, uh, we have two kinds of um, healthcare providers. So public and private providers. The main coronary catheterization facilities uh, in the public, it is the one hospital and Al Ain hospital. Uh, in the private sector, we have Med Clinic, a new medical center and Virgil Hospital. Around 70% of the coronary interventions are done in the public hospitals, which is the one and uh, Al Ain hospital. Um, the 24 seven STEMI cover uh, unfortunately, until now, it's uh, only covered by the two public hospitals, mainly, especially during the after working hours. And this puts a huge demand on the two hospitals, especially uh, since the COVID-19 uh, started. We have our uh, Al Ain Hospital has been announced by the government and the uh, regulator uh, to be COVID-19 hospital, and it, it's a lockdown uh, since almost February. So Tawam Hospital is almost taking the burden of the STEMI uh, since then. Uh, so how is our uh, STEMI 24 hours covered? Uh, 
It's covered actually by one on-call interventional team, covers both hospitals with a backup interventional strata in case needed to activate both cath labs at the same time. So wherever the patient is presenting either in Al-Ain or Tawam Hospital or any other uh, centers uh, and he should be referred to one of these hospitals, the uh, interventional on-call will be activated and uh, uh, the patient will be directed to the nearest hospital. This is our chest pain protocol for the primary PCI facilities. It's outlining the timing, as you can see, outlining the pathway of the patient as, as, as well, and the management that the patient should receive across the, these times. So if the patient arrives to any of the um, uh, primary PCI capable facility, uh, he should have his uh, ECG within five to 10 minutes. He should receive his treatments and the cath lab should be activated within another 10 minutes. Cath team should arrive and open the artery within less than 90 minutes. And this is the second chest pain uh, pathway, which is for the non-PCI, uh, primary PCI facilities. Uh, so again, it's outlining the timing of the patient, the pathway of the patient, and the management that the patient should receive according to the latest guidelines. These protocols were created in 2017 and they are updated uh, yearly by the by Al Ain uh, STEMI network group. So if we see a patient going to uh, any of uh, non-primary PCI facilities and following him after the ECG, the referring physician in the non-primary PCI facility should call only one number. To this number, it is actually the switchboard of the Wam hospital. And this switchboard is holding the on-call rotor. So the physician easily will call this number and ask for the interventional on-call. And the interventional call will give the uh, will we'll direct the patient to the nearest hospital, either Al Ain or Tawam Hospital. And then the chain will go from there, uh, all the way to opening the artery within less than uh, 20, 120 minutes. Our, uh, our door to balloon time in 2019, of course, we will not take 2020 because of COVID-19 and it's still uh, ongoing year. So 2019 for Al Ain and Tawam Hospital, we achieved 96% uh, of our door to balloon within less than 90 minutes. And our mean uh, door to balloon time was around 74 uh, minutes. So uh, next I will talk about the challenges and the areas of improvements. So only we could include around 50 to 60% of Al-Ain region centers where patients may present with chest pain. Uh, and uh, we included them in Al Ain STEMI network uh, because it's actually a self uh, effort. And for this, we need the help of the regulator to support uh, Al Ain STEMI network to include all the centers of Al Ain region. This will lead to better standardization of the protocol and management. It will lead again to um, easier and faster access uh, of our patients to the STEMI care and STEMI management. Uh, another challenge is that the only 24-7 STEMI care providers are Tawam and Al-Ain Hospital. Um, and now, as I said, since almost February, our Al-Ain Hospital is locked down completely for COVID-19 and it's locked down for future uh, second wave uh, hopefully, inshallah, we will not have any second wave, but for now, it's uh, the, uh, the, the standalone hospital for STEMI 24 hours is the home hospital. Our brothers' uh, private hospitals, they do, uh, they do some STEMIs, but uh, especially during the working hours, and we still receive uh, lots of referrals from them during the uh, after working hours. So we need to encourage our uh, private coronary intervention providers to start covering 24-7 STEMI services. And this will lead to wider cover and faster delivery of the management for STEMI patients. Another challenge that uh, we have fragmented data and statistics as uh, each center 
has its own data collection system, and this makes it uh, difficult for us to identify the points of weakness and the areas of development. So uh, myself, I feel that uh, we need seriously to think of uh, national registry or maybe upgrading the existing uh, Saha uh, Cat Lab uh, Abu Dhabi registry to, uh, to include our uh, private hospitals and make it as a national registry for Emirates of Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much. And I am very happy to share this, this uh, um, experience with you, our challenges. And uh, as I said, we are learning from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for an excellent talk and update on uh, care in the uh, Eastern region or Lion region, as we should say now. Uh, so next we'll have uh, Dr. Abdel Majid uh, Zubedi, uh, who will be giving us an update on STEMI management in the Abu Dhabi region. Uh, Dr. Abdul Majid is the current president of the Emirates Cardiac Society, past CMO at SKMC and uh, Mafrag Hospitals, and currently the CMO for uh, the Ministry of Presidential Affairs Hospitals. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Abdul Majid. You're muted. You're still muted. We cannot hear you, Dr. Abdul Majid. You're mute. Unmute. Okay. Now you're good. I got it lost between the the different screens. So, uh, so you got my screen, right? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mahmoud, and uh, uh, thanks to the previous speakers, Dr. Antman and uh, Dr. Ali. So, um, uh, you know, I'm going to set the stage. I mean, the, uh, Dr. Antman uh, was part of this uh, uh, statement and, uh, you know, we've been trying to address the, uh, the, the management of STEMI as, as uh, the process part of the, of the management. I think we have a lot of cath labs in the, in the country and uh, that is equipped and staffed uh, very well to deliver the procedure but we need a lot of work to improve the process and the access of patients to, uh, you know, to this um, uh, care. Uh, so in, um, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, I think uh, going back, uh, two th uh, back six years or seven years uh, ago, we had a lot of challenges in managing STEMIs. And uh, if you are a patient and you present, uh, you know, during the daytime, you get a different care if you present, uh, uh, you know, uh, after hours. So some hospitals uh, has cath labs, but they used to, you know, to deliver uh, a primary PCR only during the daytime. They uh, some used to thrombolize patients 24 hours and do uh, these patients as an, on a semi-elective basis. Uh, there was a variation in the standards and measuring quality, the way door to balloon time as it. Uh, elaborated by Dr. Ali. So there's a variation in, in measuring the door to the long time. Transfers across facilities, a lot of delays uh, we've been seeing. And also there's a competition among healthcare providers, you know, for patients, as you can see in anywhere. Uh, uninsured patients, we had some challenges with that. And, uh, and also the providers themselves didn't have the, uh, you know, the solution to the to the uh, to the problem. So uh, what we uh, we agreed on as a public sector. So in Abu Dhabi, the the, the healthcare system is uh, there is a you know the public sector and the prop and the and the private sector, uh, and um, and as a, a part of the pub public sector, you know where multiple hospitals, uh, twelve hospitals, uh, a lot of primary care centers and uh, urgent care centers. We agreed to have a primary PCI as the standard reperfusion strategy for all patients who presents to uh, you know to our uh, healthcare system. So that was the first uh, you know uh, thing that we agreed on, and then uh, we divided the uh, you know our uh, region into um, or uh, you know uh, into, sorry we divided you know uh, the, the whole Emirate into a different regions according to the to the different providers. So those blue dots, as you can see here, is either a hospital or a primary care or an urgent care uh, facility that belongs to the public sector at that time. 
and uh, and then we uh, you know we agreed that every every group will have uh, will take care of their uh, own uh, region so the providers say within this uh, region will uh, will take care of all the facilities and guarantee access for all, any of these facilities to to get the uh, to get the primary uh, pci uh, remote areas of course was treated uh, with uh, with what we thought we we call uh, drip and ship so and the other thing is we also we looked at the problem from uh, the way the patients present either a walk-in or patients who comes to us through the ems or those who comes from hospitals that are close to a cath lab centers and also hospitals that uh, have a cath lab or remote hospitals that are very far away um, from uh, from pci centers so looking at that we developed protocols that addresses um, any of those challenges either it's a geographical or it's a uh, uh, it's a availability of the service and back 13 the, we we ensure that all patients who present to a hospital where there's a cath lab at least they get the those patients at least you know those patients we make sure that they can receive you know, uh, uh, reperfusion uh, therapy. And then we moved to hospital that does not have a cath lab and then expanded to remote areas to uh, and implemented a protocol, drip and ship protocol. And then 2014 and 16, we, um, uh, our colleagues from the EMS um, uh, were, were engaged and, uh, and we had a lot of work with them to, uh, to ensure that we have a protocol uh, to, act, to activate the cath lab in the pre-hospital uh, uh, setting. And uh, recently, over the last two years, we've been working with our colleagues in the private sector, but uh, of course there is uh, challenges there. The number of stems that presents to the public sector, this is 2018, what we call Saha Network, is uh, about 700 uh, stemmies. And um, as you can see in red, those who had uh, a PCI performed were about 639 out of 750. So it's, um, it's something close to high 80%. Uh, percent. Um, so they, in terms of access to the, to the lab, uh, sorry, to the, to, to the service, uh, it improved uh, significantly. Another aspect uh, is the quality of the, of, the, of the service itself. And if you look back in 2008 and 9, the um, uh, percentage of patients, as you can see in the upper graph, uh, who, who um, uh, are treated within 90 minutes, been extremely low and, uh, and the mean door to balloon time was, was very high. Uh, Dr. Antman showed us some of the strategies that was uh, that uh, reduces the time to uh, the door to balloon time uh, as uh, uh, you know recommended by the uh, uh, mission lifeline and other uh, bodies and we implemented some of those um, those uh, strategies. And as you can see, we improved um, the door to balloon time significant. And these have been sustained over the last uh, few years. Uh, and that uh, didn't happen uh, easily. I mean, it was a lot of uh, challenges, you know, to get, say, the emergency physician to activate the cath lab to, um, uh, you know, to have one code to, to monitor the time. To, for the team to arrive and so on. So uh, quality of the care, I think, is is getting um, is improving uh, significantly. Um, another important point, and this is out of the registry, just to show the burden of this uh, disease. And as you can see here, uh, the blue is uh, male and females are uh, in, uh, I don't even think or something there. Uh, but uh, the the age uh, of this population compared to, uh, to a lot of um, areas in the world, we have um, this disease um, striking and affecting a very young uh, age. We see 30s and 40s, and that's many uh, life years lost. And uh, so the impact of, uh, of, uh, of what we're doing is, uh, does have a, a major impact on, on, on these patients and their families. Uh, you know, we're, uh, the disease is hitting a, a very young uh, uh, 
population. The referral still, I mean, this is a patient who walks into the emergency compared to the transfers. I don't have the slide of those who presents to the, um, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, uh, directly to, uh, sorry, through the EMS, but those are still relatively low compared to a lot of places. A lot of good work done by our EMS colleagues and uh, to improve that, uh, that part uh, in terms of educating uh, the patients and, uh, or the public and also um, being available for them by, uh, by the ambulance and having a, uh, you know, a, a good response from the ambulance. The mortality in, in our uh, uh, cohort uh, have been uh, reasonable. Unfortunately, this is not a risk adjusted, uh, but I would expect that if it's adjusted, it would be higher because we're having a younger population. So uh, we need to, uh, you know, to, to to compare this with a, with an international uh, uh, registries, uh, they um, so going back and looking at the bigger picture now. So I talked about the public sector, but now this is the whole sector in in, in Abu Dhabi, and this is data comes from some of it from the Department of Health. I know it's old; it goes back to a year or two years back. But we have 56 hospitals. We have a lot of centers and clinics, and we have a lot of licensed uh, payers. And as you can see here, we have about 3 million uh, population in the whole Emirate. And uh, we estimate about 2,000 STEMIs annually. Most of them, because of the population, are in this region, what we call uh, the, the, the capital uh, city or the, um, the Abu Dhabi area, Al Ain area, and then the remote area over here, which is about 300 uh, kilometers away from uh, from the you know, from the main cities. So, but the most of the population are living here. So, 90% of the population uh, can access a, a the service uh, easily, uh, and cath labs are within a driving uh, distance from from these uh, people. So, uh, so, so the, the accessibility of the care, I think, is relatively easy, and it's just fine-tuning the, uh, the, the, uh, the system and the process to ensure that the patients reach the service in a timely uh, manner. Uh, this data comes from, uh, I'm going to finish with this slide, or this next slide, or before then. Uh, so they, they, this, this data just shows you the number of, of STEMIs from uh, the claim data. I think this is underestimating the number. We think it's more than this, but it kind of gives you an idea that still we're having about 240 patients, which is about, I would say, maybe 13% or 15% uh, to 15% are not uh, reperfused. Uh, thrombolysis is used mainly in the remote areas uh, these days. And then the majority, I guess, uh, receives a PCI. Um, one question to the regulator, and I think it's going to be shown in the next uh, presentation, is those who uh, the door to balloon uh, time. So to conclude, I think uh, a lot of work has been done, but still we need uh, you know, to have a, a national registry, uh, more educational initiatives and more standardization of costs. Uh, of course, we need um, uh, you know, uh, to establish a public and a private sector collaborations and the standardizing metrics for STEMI uh, with, the, with the regulator, I think is very important. Engaging the EMS uh, uh, in Abu Dhabi uh, and Abu Dhabi Police Department uh, for, with, for inter-hospital transfers is, is very important. There's a challenge there. And of course, optimizing and enhancing pre-hospital STEMI care and the public education uh, to reduce the time to get to the hospital or to call for help. So that's what I have, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the end. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Majid, for an excellent talk. Um, for the audience, if you do have questions, just type them in the uh, Q&A box, uh, and then we'll, we'll get to them at the end. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dirk Richter. Uh, Dr. Richter is a senior advisor for the Department of Health and he leads the Health Tech Innovation Ecosystem Establishment here in Abu, in, in Abu Dhabi. And he'll be talking about to us about the role of regulators in STEMI management. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. 
Um, yes, let me just give you some brief uh, ideas about what a regulator can do in order to support STEMI care. I mean, first of all, um, Abu Dhabi Departments of Health truly believe healthcare should be with healthcare professionals. So it's very important to have a clear role as a regulator where you can facilitate and support the system while not getting too much involved in operations in, in hospitals. And that's, I think, a very important first uh, guiding principle for us. Now, um, if you look at what can regulators do, basically there are three things and many of them already mentioned, but I will look at them from the point of view of a regulator. So the first one is of course, you need clear roles and responsibilities. I mean, looking back uh, before 2012, 11, even earlier, um, many people were doing many things. And if you look at this relatively small population, it's, it's very important to, to centralize certain services and of course, PCI on and on to hospitals and only a few of them in order to, to achieve reasonable volumes and routine and, and excellence in care. Secondly, um, basic management principle, if you don't measure, you will never improve. So it's very important to set targets, to measure against, and also as a regulator to give some incentives for those who achieve or even uh, overachieve the targets. And third thing, uh, we're talking about a STEMI care system. So it's very important um, to continuously communicate with all, all partners uh, and get all of them uh, on board in order to improve the entire system. So let me just briefly tell you what we do. Actually, in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, I would like to refer to our website. There is a STEMI protocol. You can see on the left, uh, which includes roles and responsibilities, processes, what's going to happen. So that's available for everybody. And that's nothing that has been developed uh, by a team somewhere remote in government offices, but this is something that has be, uh, been developed together with the STEMI care task force, with the experts in the market. So something that has been agreed by, by everybody and that's the basis for, for what we do. The same, by the way, you can see on the right, we have for stroke and other, other things that also require similar approaches. Um, now, set targets, measure against, incentivize. I mean, of course, door to balloon time, that's the most crucial figure. I mean, you've heard so many times today, uh, what we have created, and you can see on the small inset at the bottom on the right, uh, we have created an entire quality metrics, not for, for STEMI care only, but across all service lines, across all hospitals, started in 2014 was a tiny number of 22 indicators. Now it's um, much more than 100, some for each service line. So we look at each um, service line, each hospital from a specific point of view, set targets, of course, the magic 90 minutes is our target as well. And we also uh, expect providers to um, uh, treat 90% of all patients within this 90 um, minutes. So what happened, I mean, this is basically what uh, reflects what uh, Dr. Abdul Majid already showed some minutes ago without going into detail, but going from uh, the left to the right, you can see this is the time. So it started 15 and this is the, are the actual figures that um, when we started, not everybody achieved those targets. Now um, we usually overachieve them looking at the whole market, which doesn't mean that there are individual hospitals who need to improve and of course, uh, of potential for improvement, but nevertheless, looking at the entire market, there's significant improvement. Now, um, again, looking at the whole system, I think Dr. Dr. Mesa will uh, go more into detail, so I don't have to mention much more, but of course, we also look at, at pre-hospital care, ambulance performance in order to, uh, to capture um, the whole system. Last not least, um, if you look uh, at the slide, you will recognize some of the names you can see on the screen today. So there is a um, STEMI task force, and uh, you can also see that a lot of um, participants and members from DOH joined this task force. You can see our um, national insurance company, Daman, and all the relevant hospitals. Um, so what we try to do, and I hope uh, <laughs> 
Dr. Abdul Majid, Dr. Mahmoud would agree with some success is to, to facilitate the process of communication, to help to, uh, to fix things. Sometimes things are not only related to healthcare providers, you need health insurance in order to make sure that things happen since everybody needs reimbursement and so on. So our Dhabi Department of Health tries to, um, to work with everybody to join those task forces, support wherever we can in order to um, help to continuously improve the process and the, the entire system. Pre-hospital care is the current focus now, of course, patient education already mentioned, so there are plenty of, of areas for improvement in Abu Dhabi. What we try to do is um, not to dictate anything, but really to, to talk to all and communicate with everybody in order to, to achieve targets. So basically, uh, that's my very brief overview of, of how we approach STEMI care. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Dirk, uh, for that excellent presentation. And uh, next, uh, we'll go on to Dr. Maithal Dirai, who is the, uh, Dr. Maithal is the Deputy Director of the Ambulance Department at the Abu Dhabi Police, and she's a consultant uh, physician in emergency medicine. And she's going to update us on the role of the uh, ambulance care and STEMI management. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, and uh, thank you for having me uh, tonight. So, after all of these great speakers who talked to you about the importance of uh, a STEMI pathway, uh, I'm going to end this session talking about the role of EMS in STEMI care. So in the coming 10 minutes, we'll talk about the Abu Dhabi Police Ambulance, the pre-hospital involvement in STEMI care, and the activation of STEMI pathway in Abu Dhabi, and the challenges that faced us in, at the initiation and maintaining the STEMI pathway, and what are the, le the learning lessons from our experience in Abu Dhabi region. So, uh, Abu Dhabi Police, uh, through its emer uh, Emergency and Public Safety Directorate, started to provide ambulance services to uh, Abu Dhabi region in 2001. And after that, it expanded into Al Ain and Al Dhafra regions. Uh, we have multiple uh, level of providers in the field. We have the Emergency Medical Technician EMT Basic, we have EMT Intermediate, EMT Advanced Paramedics, and Emergency Doctors. Each one of them has different privileges. And uh, the one mainly you see in the field are the AMTs, while the emergency doctors are providing uh, online uh, supervision and on call. In regards to the vehicles, the main ones we have is, of course, the ambulance vehicle and the incident response unit, among other vehicles. In the incident response unit, usually uh, it has the advanced paramedic who respond to uh, an incident such as STEMI case. Um, for the ambulance vehicles, it's the one that's carrying the patient to the hospitals uh, after providing the necessary care in the field. All our vehicles are equipped with defibrillators and chest compressors. Um, if you look at a report, a special report that is published in the Journal of American Heart Association in January, at the beginning of this year, 2020, you'll see um, the pre-hospital activation of hospital uh, resources or pre-act for ST-segment elevation myocardial infarction, a standardized approach to pre-hospital activation and direct to catheterization laboratory for STEMI. And that is a recommendation from the American Heart Association mission lifeline program that Dr. Antman talked about. If you read the articles, you'll see lots of the things that most of it was implemented actually in Abu Dhabi and we'll go through that. So what was our involvement in uh, the uh, STEMI care as Abu Dhabi Police Ambulance? We joined the STEMI task force that was uh, established by the Department of Health, as Dr. Derek mentioned. It has uh, the involvement of all stakeholders. Um, then uh, the STEMI task force designed uh, a pathway, activation pathway of those patients uh, that need to be identified first. Uh, um, and we decided as a team that we're going to make uh, or we're going to depend on our paramedics in the field to actually uh, 
check the 12 lead ECG and uh, diagnose STEMI and activate the CAT lab. Uh, we went through training and drills with the whole task force, with our uh, stakeholders, including the uh, Saha uh, Operation Center, uh, of course, our own operation center as Abu Dhabi police, uh, among uh, our uh, hospitals in uh, Saha in Abu Dhabi region, which was uh, SKMC and Al Mafraq at that time, currently is uh, SSMC. Uh, later, we were joined by uh, Cleveland Clinic. Then we went through the implementation uh, phases, uh, which started with a pilot project in uh, the middle of the, let's say the island of Abu Dhabi itself. Uh, during the pilot phase, uh, we noticed few things that we worked with before we uh, expanded the coverage of the system. Uh, we as well as Abu Dhabi Police um, uh, Ambulance, uh, we continuously and have been involved with the team for providing STEMI care. And we are, our role in public education uh, is ongoing. So during the activation of the STEMI pathway in Abu Dhabi Emirate, as I mentioned, uh, it was started as a pilot project in Abu Dhabi uh, Island itself through our uh, Abu Dhabi plans, uh, ambulance branch. Uh, that was at the end of 2014 and the beginning of 2015. Uh, after that, by maybe if I'm not mistaken, I think around five or six months, we went into the other branch and the, then the third branch where we covered ca currently the whole uh, Abu Dhabi region. That, uh, what you see in front of you is the initial STEMI pathway map that we give to our EMTs. And um, you could see that the ambulance, here they have three calls to make. So our staff are gonna call uh, Saha OCC to inform them that they have a STEMI patient uh, who in, uh, in turn are gonna call the hospital. While our, uh, our staff are gonna inform our operation center as well that we're moving and they will inform the uh, emergency department. So that was a bit of lots of calls for an uh, EMT or a paramedic in the field. Uh, this is the latest uh, STEMI flow chart for, uh, for the EMTs from uh, our partner, uh, Abu Dhabi Health Services, Saha, SKMC. If you look at the middle part, if our uh, staff, they, is it, if they diagnose it as a STEMI, then they're gonna administer the GTN and aspirin and the analgesia, and they will give oxygen if it is less than 90. And then they will consider the location because currently we have in the island itself, we take the patient either to uh, SKMC or to uh, Cleveland Clinic, depending on the region, and that is actually based on uh, the um, the time that would take from our ambulances to transfer the patient to the uh, respective hospital. So if it is uh, within the red zone, then they will call Saha SOS, who will uh, transfer the call to the inter interventional uh, cardiologist if it is within the working hours and if it is after working hours, they're gonna call the um, emergency department who will activate the cat lab. Uh, if it is in the blue zone, we're gonna call our partners in uh, Cleveland Clinic who are gonna re respond as well and by receiving our patients. So you could see that the complicated uh, process did not come overnight, it took time for it for all of us to appreciate uh, to reach such level through the training we went from 2014 uh, we started with an ecg workshop for our staff to diagnose uh, st elevation mi and the the training is continuous until uh, recently so this is the, those are pictures from the ems workshop 2019 in collaboration with our partners in saha which is which was titled Health chest pain expert, uh, ex expertise in action from field to world. So they take our um, staff, they walk them through the process of the patient so they would realize how important it is to diagnose ST elevation in the field and how that could play a role in saving the patient's life. So they would go through even the cath lab and they will see what would happen to the patient uh, throughout his journey. In training as well, uh, 
we as Abu Dhabi Police uh, Services uh, uh, joined the STEMI Task Force Symposium that was held by the STEMI Task Force um, uh, well, um, especially with uh, Dr. Abdel Majid previously and the team now following in uh, SKMC. So lots of symposium and lectures were, were done and our staff was attending all of that. This is all to implement uh, and to emphasize the importance of discovering STEMI on time. For the drills, we, uh, this is just to show you that we started drills even at the beginning of 2015. And some of the drills actually were by calling uh, the Saha uh, the, uh, OCC at that time, currently SOS. So our staff is, are going to call the number and we're going to tell them that we're, we're having an uh, ST elevation in my patient and we'll see the reaction of the um, the, take, uh, the call taker in Saha OCC. And together, we worked all of us together as one team to achieve the best possible uh, outcome for the patient. Uh, we, are, we are participating as well uh, in drills with our partners. And this is some picture from SKMC STEMI drill that happened in 2019. And through we started the drill from the field to the uh, emergency department and to the cath lab. And the time was calculated throughout the process. For public education, uh, since the uh, Emergency and Public Safety Directorate started its action, we have something called Community uh, Ambulance uh, Branch that is actually responsible for educating uh, the population about the importance of first aid in general. And here you could see that they were uh, the Earth, Earth Hour outreach activity was mainly about uh, CBR hands only or hands only CBR. Um, and the importance of it for the population. For pre-hospital activation of cath lab, uh, all the indication uh, shows that uh, if the activation happened in the pre-hospital, and that would save us time uh, from first medical contact to uh, the device or to balloon. Uh, so we, the implementation went through uh, training our staff, making sure that they, uh, they could recognize STEMI uh, and they could differentiate between different reasons that could cause ST elevation. Uh, the result that we got is uh, this is uh, door to balloon or actually first medical contact to device in 2019 by month and the average was uh, 62 minutes, 62.6. .6, so you could see less than 63 uh, minutes from uh, the first medical contact to balloon, and that's, that is a really good time uh, for, uh, uh, for our staff and for the whole system, actually. The challenges we faced, uh, the main one was the uh, false uh, activation the, or the false positives. Um, and we handled that by uh, the training for the, the staff and as well by transmit, transmitting the ACG. So, I'll talk to you a little bit about the uh, communication between the pre-hospital and the hospitals. So our defibrillator is connected to the tough book where the patient, uh, where the paramedics or the EMTs uh, put the EBCR, the electronic patient record, uh, and that is transmitted to a screen in the emergency department of all our hospitals. Uh, I mean, the hospital in Abu Dhabi Emirate. So you could see this is a, a real case. If you look at the first one, it says the estimated time of arrival is 14 minutes and the patient has chest pain as chief complaint. So what happened, we clicked on the ECG data and that was in the emergency department before the arrival of the patient. And this is the ECG of the patient. And you could see clearly that the patient is having an inferior ST elevation MI, and that was 11 minutes before arrival. So the patient was still in the field. So this is just a quick video to show you that it's still seven minutes before arrival, and you could see live feed from the uh, device and the ambulance, uh, along with the vital signs before the arrival of the patient to the hospital. The challenges that faced us uh, at the initiation uh, was um, the, of course, the training of the 
paramedics, the activation of the uh, specific number from uh, Saha SOS, and um, the how the staff actually uh, got used to the new system, implementing the new system. Maintaining it was a bit difficult, especially with the uh, increased false activation from our side. So we managed the, that by uh, training our staff and transmitting the ECGs to the emergency department for uh, emphasis from the emergency uh, physicians as well. The, the lesson uh, that we learned from our uh, involvement in the STEMI task force in Abu Dhabi is the, how important it is to have all stakeholders uh, coming with you under one umbrella from the regulation, regulating body. Uh, and that was in Abu Dhabi, the Department of Health. Uh, the importance of continuous training and the implementation of the processes, clear communication between all parties, uh, monitoring of the effectiveness of the system and the feedback, uh, you need feedback, as uh, Dr. Antman mentioned, to assess the system that you're uh, following. And as Dr. Drek mentioned, we have KPIs for the pre-hospital, for the hospital, and throughout the whole system. And that would lead to the continuous improvement. Uh, thank you, and I will receive your uh, question at the end of the uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, so I think now we're at the uh, discussion portion. Uh, we received a lot of questions, so I'll try to kind of spread them out among the various speakers. So uh, I'll start with Dr. Antman. We have a couple of questions. I'll kind of summarize them. Basically, one there was a lot of concerns about uh, reporting and data and worried about negative, punitive nature of when, you when, when all these hospitals have to report their data. Are you, is there going to be a punitive nature on this? And along those same lines, what are the criteria for STEMI receiving and referring hospitals that you've kind of outlined in, the, in, in your guidelines? You're on mute still. So. Yeah. Thank you for that question and a series of questions. A very important point. Uh, so let's, let's start with the philosophy of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to work as a team we'll call it a system of care uh, to improve the health of patients, specifically in this case with ST elevation myocardial infarction. And it is very important that we recognize uh, that there are strong links and weak links uh, in the chains that constitute the team. Uh, and we have to help each other. So we have worked very hard to maintain a positive attitude and to avoid uh, blaming. Uh, and the, the way we've dealt with that is to uh, have people contribute and share best practices. So uh, the, the sharing of those best practices is, is a positive way to deal with some differences that might initially be observed in how quickly one hospital system can take care of the problem versus another. Uh, there are things that we can do for each other. Maintaining that positive and sharing attitude is the best. And there has to be a champion or a series of champions or leaders who convey that spirit. And all of the panelists here have talked about this. So I think uh, you have what you need. Um, it, it needs to be uh, transmitted throughout the hospital leadership as well. Now, uh, the details for hospitals that are STEMI receiving and referral hospitals are listed on our Mission Lifeline website. Um, and I think it would take a while to read out all of those and it may interfere with our ability to handle some of the other questions. Um, <coughs> I would refer to the Mission Lifeline website where we have the technical details uh, listed. In general, uh, the hospitals that are uh, STEMI referral hospitals uh, have to have uh, a, a very short time for moving the patient out of their hospital to the STEMI receiving hospital. The STEMI receiving hospitals have to have a cath lab system uh, that uh, preferably is available 24 hours, seven days a week, and can achieve those short door to balloon times that we've been talking about. All right, thank you, Dr. Amin. Um, Dr. Ali uh, received a few questions about STEMI and in the COVID era. 
and how are you handling it? And is there change in your protocols or your process in, in dealing with it in, in this in this time frame? Thank you, Dr. Trainer. So a very good question. Uh, it takes us again back to the COVID era. Uh, so in the beginning of the COVID era, we met through the um, MRS Cardiac Society and actually uh, Saha Cardiology Council, and we came up with the uh, guidelines. So um, we agreed on treating all STEMI uh, and the, the primary PCI will be the choice of treatment for all kinds of STEMIs. This was during the COVID-19, uh, uh, sorry, COVID-19 yes, era. So it was uh, always um, primary PCI uh, as a choice of treatment. Um, as I said earlier, uh, during my talk, um, Al Ain Hospital was chosen to be COVID-19 and was locked down completely. So we were receiving at Tawam Hospital um, the patients with, with chest pain uh, through Al Ain uh, ER or through other centers. Our uh, colleagues in the private sector, they were helping as well, but mainly during uh, working hours. So um, for us in Tawam Hospital, it was a mixed COVID and non-COVID uh, hospital until almost uh, two months back where we became, uh, or one month back where we became a non-COVID hospital. So for now, uh, still Al Ain Hospital is completely locked down. Uh, still we are the only uh, um, public hospital providing uh, the, the systemic uh, ST elevation uh, primary PCI service. Uh, for the patients who is coming uh, directly to our ER without uh, test, so we take them as if they are COVID-19 with the proper uh, um, protective measures and we treat them directly with the primary PCI. So um, we, of course, we are now having again from um, the Saha Cardiology Council, the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, guidelines. So we have changed a little bit our uh, agreed on during the, the one we made for the COVID-19 in terms of the diagnostic, in terms of uh, elective procedures. So we came up with uh, agreed on uh, guidelines for uh, Saha facilities through the Cardiology Council. I think I answered the question if... Uh... Th thank you, and for Dr. Amin, as a follow-up, I got a question. With the AHA, what are you doing with door to balloon time monitoring in the COVID era, and has that changed? Uh, in, in April 2020, the American Heart Association published a position statement about how to deal with STEMI during the COVID era. And it was recognized that uh, business as usual, with emphasis on primary PCI as much as possible with these short door to balloon times may not be technically possible during the COVID era because of the need for personal protective equipment and the extra time it takes uh, as part of the reperfusion pathway. So one of the things that has been uh, introduced is don't allow a STEMI patient to fall into that no reperfusion category uh, that we saw from Dr. al -Zubaydi. We want to avoid that. And of course, the option of fibrinolysis is out there. And we should make sure that our teams are trained in how to give fibrinolytic therapy. I think many of you will experience the fact that as you talk to your cardiology fellows, they may graduate from a fellowship program without ever having given fibrinolytic therapy. And if we have an emergency situation like we have now, they will not be equipped to actually give fibrinolytic therapy. So it's important that as part of the kind of training that Dr. Metha was talking about, we include uh, the concept that fibrinolysis remains an option. And we should think about that if there are gonna be uh, particularly long delays in the pandemic situation now. Thank you. This uh, next question, I think, is uh, both for Dr. Abdelmajid and Dr. Mehta. Um, in terms of Dr. Abdelmajid, you mentioned that almost 80% of patients with STEMI are walk-in, which seems uh, out of step with a lot of the, at least, U.S. and Western Europe uh, region. So what, what, first, to you, why do you think that is? 
And then I'll ask the same for Dr. Mehta. Yeah. Uh, I think there is still, there is a, um, uh, I mean, part of it is public education. So we need uh, more uh, education to the public uh, to use the, uh, the EMS system. We have an excellent uh, EMS system as uh, shown in the presentation by uh, Dr. Ameta. You know, you saw the advanced electronic system that they have, the advanced cars that they have, the staffing. I mean, I got the, uh, the chance to meet uh, the, uh, the EMS crew. They're very knowledgeable. They know what they're doing. They have protocols. So we have the infrastructure and I think the you know, public education, I don't know, you know, the role of uh, EMS, maybe the regulator, uh, our colleagues at the Department of Health, you know, campaigning uh, and educating the public about, you know, what is uh, about chest pain and, and acute MIs. Um, the other part is also, uh, we had a survey that was done by, um, by one of uh, our colleagues from the ambulance in collaboration, I think, with the or Eloy, and, uh, and they surveyed the patients, uh, the uh, acute MI patients, as to why they did not call the EMS. And this was done a few years back, but I think some of the factors still applies. And, and, and one of them is related to, uh, you know, to, the, to, the, to the addresses of the street and so on. I mean, they, they, the way uh, the, the streets, I think, are... are uh, 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 you know, are uh, put in, in Abu Dhabi still there's some challenges in, in describing the addresses. So they would rather just take their cars than calling and try to explain where they are. I don't know where are we at. Uh, maybe Dr. Ameta can talk about that, that part. But there is a multiple factors that, have, you know, that prevents patients or pub people from calling uh, the EMS. Maybe Dr. Ameta, and, uh, you know, you can elaborate more on that. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Majid. Actually, um, I, at least I have one statistics from uh, one of our uh, collaborative hospitals, SKMC. Last year, 2019, 30% uh, of the patients who had STEMI came actually through the EMS. So we, we transport a good number of STEMI cases to, to the hospitals. And we do the uh, public education, as you mentioned, Dr. Abdel Majid, that is really important to reach out to the uh, public and inform them about uh, the STEMI symptoms. So they need to, to realize the symptom that uh, they need to call the ambulance for. Um, in regards to the uh, directions and uh, the activation of the uh, ambulance, it's always improving. So. Um, especially in, inside uh, the Abu Dhabi island and in Abu Dhabi region in general, uh, our ambulances, the average uh, time to reach the, uh, the patient is actually within our uh, KBIs, which is really good. As a follow-up, Dr. Mehta, for, for that, uh, some, uh, some, a couple of questions regards to the role of the private sector and private hospitals in the uh, STEMI network and uh, involvement with, with STEMI care in terms of transferring patients? Okay. Um, currently, we transfer uh, the STEMI cases to uh, whether uh, Saha facilities in Abu Dhabi or to uh, S, um, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, involvement of the private uh, hospitals, I think, with the STEMI task force through Department of Health, that could be done as well. Uh, Dr. Dirk, uh, in terms of the role of the regulator, um, in terms of what's the feedback loop mechanism you have in place with hospitals, and is there a feedback also to the STEMI referring hospitals, and not, not only the STEMI receiving? Are you monitoring door in, door out times? Uh, yeah. things like that? Um, that, that's what, what we have to, to add in future. Actually, the, the whole monitoring right now, there's a specific reason why uh, it's, it's self-reporting. So, I mean, we started this, this Jordan Quality Initiative in 2014. I mean, there, there is, of course, it would be a way to, to uh, collect all the figures without uh, involving the providers. But for us, it's a journey. I mean, it's a collaborative approach, not only for STEMI, but for all kinds of, of quality we, uh, indicators we're looking at. So it's basically self-reporting. It's validated by, by, by us. But still, it's, it's a way of, of self-reporting since we, we need this collaborative approach um, yeah, 
So that's the way we do it. But of course, I mean, um, looking at referring hospitals, we need to, to improve and also look at them. That's of course the, the missing link as well as the, the pre-hospital phase before uh, would be, uh, police is involved. So I think those are the big areas where we need to still improve. Okay, great. Um, any other specific comments from any of the panelists that you want to add? No, I, I you know, uh, Mahmoud, I, you know, I, uh, I'm just trying to, you know, you know, to go back to the objective of this, and I think, you know, a recognition and edu public, edu uh, public education and especially uh, healthcare uh, Education on recognition and on triaging is, is very important. It's the responsibility of, uh, of all of us. Uh, I think we're expecting from uh, our colleagues and um, the Department of Health to move ahead with the, you know, with the quality indicators that uh, monitors you know, the door, uh, like door in, door out, uh, the, you know, the, the registry. Um, and uh, there is a positive response that we saw and uh, you know to move those projects uh, forward, and I think this is this will uh, will help definitely improve you know improve the uh, the care because that's where you know if we don't measure it, we as Dr. Anthony said, we will not uh, will not get anywhere. So uh, we when we measure all the, uh, the those indicators precisely, and we will um, you know definitely will, there is a chance of, of improvement. And, uh, and of course, I mean, the, the EMS and the public education is very, very uh, uh, important and still there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, I think based on the data you showed and Dr. Ali showed, our, our STEMI numbers, once they hit the door of, uh, of a receiving hospital are pretty good. Um, so our door to balloon times are pretty good. It's a question of, we don't really know a lot of what's happening before then and when they're at other institutions or in small clinics and, and how long is it taking them to get over to, to you or to Dr. Ali and, and centers like yourselves. Um, I think th those are the next step in terms of our, our care in, this, in, in our region. Dr. Trina, may I ask, may I make a suggestion? Um, th there were two things that I heard throughout the discussion uh, that I see as the, the most important points for emphasis for uh, the next steps uh, for um, the Abu Dhabi uh, STEMI task force and, and expansion. And one is taking a look at the term expansion. And I mean that both geographically and in terms of the full 24 hour period. So making sure that you have the appropriate coverage geographically and during the full 24-hour period. And the second is fragmentation of the data. Uh, because as you've just pointed out, uh, I think the hospitals are doing very well once they receive the patient, particularly at the STEMI receiving hospital. But knowing what the components are up front uh, is, a, is a challenge. It has always been a challenge for us in the United States as well. Uh, that's why that reporting form that I showed will be very helpful because it's one centralized kind of case report form, if you like, and all the data will be in one place. I believe that will help quite a bit. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Majid, any closing remarks? Uh, uh, thank you, Mahmoud. And uh, so I would like to thank all the, you know, the speakers. Uh, I'd like to thank the AHA, the American Heart Association, for uh, uh, you know for for this um, collaboration and Dr. Anton, uh, specifically your talk has been uh, great. It outlined you know the importance of uh, collaboration among uh, different pro you know uh, stakeholders who manage the STEMI care and uh, still uh, some or sometimes uh, we we think about the procedure of. of of primary PCI, but you know the the, the outcomes of of these patients um, is dictated mainly by the by the process and the, and how fast they get to to get that procedure. Uh, I think um, you know, there is a lot of work as we can we saw from you know from uh, from Dr. Ametha, from uh, Dirk, and uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, there's a lot of work that have been done in Abu Dhabi and. Uh, 
they have to be shared, but also still we have, um, we have uh, plenty of work to, uh, to do. Um, I would like to thank you all for, uh, you know, for participating in this, and uh, I'd like to thank our uh, audience uh, who um, listened to us and who asked the questions and interacted, and uh, we'll have more of this uh, in the future to, you know, to, to achieve our objectives and our goals, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.